in my head, I can see things. In my head, my eyes are open and I'm looking at things. But I'm not in reality, because that's what I've done since I was little. I just got, like, startled. <laughs> okay. Sorry. She graduated with distinction from the prestigious Trinity Laban. Now, Victoria Oruwari is carving out a professional singing career. voice is like a bright, it's not a very bright red, because I give people's, people's voices colours based, colours based on the timbre of the voice, and when I sing classically, my voice is like a rich red, and that's because I'm not a queen of the night soprano. They have what I would call crimson voices. Am I right in thinking crimson is a really bright red? I think. Oh, is it? Oh, crimson is pink? Where did I get the impression it was red? be to get a stage, a role on stage, either doing work in opera or work in musical theatre. see what things really are like because then I can see what I want to see and I can decide that the world is more beautiful than it is. first house on the street so I have to walk and find the trees and count them because at first I was thinking I'll count the doorways but then there are too many of them and you can just find yourself staggering all evening and that can be a pain so I, I, I count the trees and I know that my house is right before the second tree okay first tree 
around. And that's the second tree. And I just have to go one and then home. was born with cataract, I think. Okay. I had an operation that worked, and then when I was four or five, it started to grow again, and then they tried treating it in Nigeria, and it didn't work. The doctor detached, detached my retina in the process. Then we came to England, and the doctor that I initially had my first operation with said, oh, don't operate, because even though she may go blind, it will be gradual. But some other doctors in America persuaded us to have an operation because they felt that the detached retina had triggered off some secondary glaucoma. Secondary glaucoma is not genetic. You, you get it as a result of the eyes suffering, a tra um, suffering something traumatic. So the pressure starts to rise. So um, they try, in, the, in the middle of them trying to treat that was when I lost my sight. So this is my flat. I walk into a room, I don't just not see anything, I just decide what I think the room looks like and it takes up a form. This is my bed and this is... Oh, Ted's not here. <laughs> Having lost my sight since I was like six and a half, I still have a child's way of approaching things, so... I'd like to think houses are like the Lego that I built, you know, yellow with blue roof and a red door. I remember that's, that was my Lego. And if I was ever asked to paint a house, I'd paint the house yellow and the roof will always be blue and there'll be green grass in front and a red door. Well, I like my space in the middle because a place feels really cramped for me if there's no space in the middle. And I know some people always say, oh, you should have a coffee table in the middle of a sitting room, but I'm not an, ad I'm not an advocate of that because that coffee table is going to become the bane of my life. On the day, on the day I'm having a blind day, which is a day when I'm really tired and I can't be bothered to concentrate. I'll find myself walking into it all the time. For most of the days when I'm outside, I have to be careful. The one place I don't want to have to be careful is my house. Right. The last time I saw myself, I was about six and a half. We were in this hotel, me and my sister, in New York. And I used to come out and actually play with the images of my self because there were like six or seven of me because there were mirrors to my left right front and back so there were so many victorias and i used to like stand in front of the mirror and kind of do my little twirls even when i go out and people refer to me as the lady i'm still in shock because i'm like no that's not me i'm little i'm six but no i've actually grown up so if i did look at myself now and think hmm what has changed what do i look like I think I still have my chubby cheeks, which I like, because I, I can feel them. And I got nicely defined lips, so I can actually feel the line that separates my lips from the bit before my nose. And it's very useful for applying lipstick, because then you know, you know um, where to stop, so it doesn't run over the line. And I can feel the line there, see. My face is the first thing people see when they see me, when you walk up to someone, you say hello to them, they're looking at your face. And I think the face is really, really important. I'm not saying that without makeup, I don't feel like I'm attractive or anything, but I just like people to see that, yeah, I might have lost my sight, but I still care what I look like. I don't, I've not totally given up on wanting to live like a full and fulfilled life. I have a physical memory of where where I've been on my face. Because it's my face, I know where I've touched and where I haven't. I always leave my eyes so lost. When I was between like eight and 11, people would look at me, oh my God, what's wrong with your eyes? You know, oh my God, what's wrong with your eyes? I remember my niece, Tiffany, when she was about three and I was 13, I asked her, I said, Tiffany, do my eyes look that bad? She said, well, it doesn't look too bad. It's just a little bit blue and a little bit green, but I'm not scared of it. So I was like, so why do people always say, what's wrong with your eyes all the time? She was like, maybe because they just don't know, or maybe because it looks different. 
So here, so. So I'm just going to take your um, real yes. sense from you. Fine. Okay, I don't like your vowel. It's too smiley. It's too horizontal. I can hear e, and I want to hear e. I would probably say I'm halfway there, because I've done a lot of things. I've done opera productions. I teach singing. I now do some songwriting. I have mentored some young musicians. And then try and as if you're going. Try that. Ooh. <laughs> right. Ooh. So you try and make a round circle with your lips. Okay. Ooh. Ooh. And. Ooh. And. Music I write is partly about me, partly about how I see the world, partly about things that I've been told by other people, their experiences. And a lot of it is just to say to the world that I'm perceived to be different, but I'm just like everybody else, and I want the same things that everybody else wants. Victoria still meets with her college tutors for lessons. After my singing lesson, if I was to be going to see John, it would be room 167, thank goodness. If I had to go to 276 or any other room on the second floor, then I'll be going up eight flights of stairs. Almost there now. So there's usually Braille on the door, but no, it's not here, it's not here. Oh, where can I? Oh, there it is. So it says leading to toilets and rooms 157, then 106. Yeah, there'll be a toilet here. No, no, a toilet here. And then the water filter thing here so we can get some water to drink. Very helpful for if you're going for a singing lesson and you're coming from another lesson. So I like this corridor, it's so big and bright. First year I came and someone told me it was red and it kind of made me feel good because I like bright colors like red and pink and stuff. So to find my teacher's room, I've got to play a bit of a listening game because you can hear different songs from different rooms. But I'll check this one so I don't walk too far and then walk past the room. Um, as you can see, there's Braille on the door, so this is 169, which means I've got to go one more door to find it. and the best voice I could with the voice I had because ever since I was four and I heard Sleeping Beauty sing Once Upon a Dream, I wanted to sing like her. And the one thing that John, my teacher, hasn't actually told you is that he was the guy who actually taught her, the girl who sang Once Upon a Dream in Disney. And I found this out on the first day that I had my first singing lesson and I thought, I'm with the right teacher. Use the breath as expression. I grew up in Nigeria and um, I think I remember the only classical song I knew was Nymphs and Shepherds by Purcell, which I performed at a concert when I was 13. But I've never really been trained. And so I did A-levels and I had a singing teacher then and she prepared me for Trinity and I auditioned and initially they were like, your voice is not mature, you might not get in, because you might not be able to cope with the workload because your voice is not mature. And I was so, so miserable and I, <laughs> I got really upset. Yeah. 
what the hell? And it's going to come out as such a burst. Yes. What you going to say? Un porporcello. It's difficult working um, with a blind person because you need your eyes, you know, hands to express things. And uh, I found that with Victoria at the beginning, everything it was a blank wall. And it was so difficult to get through, to get her to open up. <laughs> When I came in, I had a girl's voice, a little girl's voice, and he helped me make it grow. He taught me how to believe in myself. Well, he helped me believe in myself a bit more. He gave me the secrets that helps the voice grow. I was able to find my, where my support muscles are and all the exercises I had to do, and gradually, all of a sudden, I had this amazing big vibrato that I didn't have before. Movement, of course, is very difficult. Stage work would need a lot of patience with the director. She's quick. She could do it if you say, right, four steps to the left, put your left arm out, but it all takes time. And a sighted singer doesn't need that. It's really, really competitive. I mean, because for every one student that's taken, about 30 are rejected. So um, in, in the real world is even a wider net, isn't it? I'd really like to know that if you were in my shoes, what would you do? You've chosen a tricky, tricky profession, very difficult profession, yeah. but it can be done. And you have the voice, the personality, you've got the dedication to do it. It's just that you need that little bit of luck. I lost my sight because some doctor didn't know what he was doing. And on a very, very down moment, I get a bit annoyed that that happened. And, I, and there's a part of me that doesn't like to give control of anything to do with me to other people because I think I'm the only one who knows what's right for me. Because sometimes when people try to do it, they get it wrong. I'm not saying everybody got it wrong, but that doctor was sit, um, sitting on a chair where he was supposed to get things right and he didn't. I don't know how he could have been comfortable to try that if he wasn't 110% sure. Because if it was my child or any other child I know, I wouldn't let that happen. I like my piano because whenever I get a bit confused and I have to think about things and stuff, I can just come and tinker and, you know, and sometimes I see, I see my piano as another friend. Like, it helps me figure things out. And because of that, I call her Christabel because, like, crystal is, like, crystal clear and I think she sounds like a bell. And even when she goes really high, like... Some people think it's a bit odd that I call my piano a name, but it's, it's actually a Strauss, it's a German piano and the wood is rosewood and... I just like everything about it because when I'm with it, I just feel... I don't know, complete. Please. 
and you know then I still didn't like know that I was blind. Okay. So when I came out of the hospital, the doctor now came out and said, you know, I, I asked the nurse to switch on the light. Yes. I and know. she said it was dark. Yes, no, know. she said she, she switched it on and then I said to her, oh, well, I can see things. Well, I'm her elder sister. And um, her, her elder sister, her friend, her mother, everything rolled into one, basically. You know. The doctor had to say to me, if ever you want to go anywhere, mm. make sure you remember to hold your sister's hand or your mum's hand. Yes. I keep telling her, you just have to be good at what you are doing because it's a talent that cannot be ignored when you're good at it. She feels, and quite rightly so, that she feels that she has to prove that um, she can do it better. And uh, well, she feels that it's demanded of her before she gets an opportunity, she would have to be much better than somebody who was as good as her because they'd probably choose the, the sighted person. And for various reasons, I think that's, that's life. I don't think there's anything I can't do. Within reason, obviously, I can't fly a plane. But I do believe that if I'm, if I'm taught, because my family has never treated me as if I couldn't do things. I, I mean, they've made me learn a lot of things. And, and it's never been, oh, you can't do it, you can't do it. Nobody says that to me except when I leave home. Oh, you can't do this and you can't do that. Independent, but I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm fiercely independent. Like, I never turn help down. Like, if, I mean, even this road near my station, if somebody came up to me and they wanted to help me across it, I let them. Because I thought, I, th I say to myself, well, for that period that person's helping me, I can switch off. So, I am independent, but I'm not uncomfortable with asking for help when I need it. I'm gonna get some pasta, so I'm gonna be cooking for myself and Tosa and my niece who's gone off to university. So this is the bit that everybody's scared of. They think, oh, she's gonna switch on the fire and then she'll put her finger in it and then it will burn her. Well, why did you let the blind girl cook? Anyway, she's gonna do it now and it's not gonna burn her, so. There we go. This is the bit that my mother doesn't like and most sighted people don't like, watching a blind person holding a knife. They always feel that you, you're gonna hurt yourself. Giving a knife to a blind person is like giving a knife to a baby, but the difference is the blind person is not a baby. You're aware that the knife is dangerous and you won't cut yourself because you don't want to. Cooking is one big thing because, you know, people say it's dangerous, you're gonna hurt yourself. Well, everybody hurts themselves. I don't think you can go through a whole lifetime and not hurt yourself once in the kitchen. It means you have to be more careful, but it doesn't necessarily mean you will have an accident in the kitchen. So the worst thing you can do as a blind person is go to the kitchen when you're tired because you can do yourself so much injury. I think I should check on the pasta though because it's been there for a while and I don't want it feeling neglected. Oh, look at all the steam. Ow. Yeah, we're like sisters. My, seven, my older sister isn't around, but um, we're always, you know, we're generally together when we have time. We spend time together, we go out to dinner, we go shopping, things like that. I like the fact that it has all these flowers on it and all that. And if but I, I were... hate it. I know, but I like it. It's really cute. It's really dark. You do know it's really dark, right? It's a dark mm. blue, right? Navy, but, dark, dark navy blue. Yeah, but it has pink flowers on. It's mm. really cute. Hide it for me. And it me. has flowers. Don't hide it. That's not very nice. But, you know, it has flowers and it's fine. It's got a bit of pink mm. and... Right purple around. flowers. They lied to you again. They didn't lie. It's got purple and pink. <laughs> a bit of... <laughs> You're getting really emotional. Drop the top. Okay, Let's fine. move on. Let's move on. OK, OK. She kind of has an odd taking for things sometimes. She's like, why can't clouds be pink? Or why, why, isn't, why is that this colour? Things like that. Because you have to remember, she lost her sight at, I think she was six years old, seven years old. So her sight, um, the way she sees things is 
I think, through the mind of a child. I could wear this other one and... Ah! This is not your day, is it? I think this is my pink. No, that's oh, the that's green. the red? Oh, is that the... Oh, why they lied to you. put it here? No, they didn't I'm lie joking. to me. <laughs> put, no, no, no. Oh, yeah. This is the one. So, I'm going to get it out now. I like this dress because it's quite Yeah, that's the one. Thing. Yeah, this is the one. I, li I like this one. I like the fact that it's got like a U neck and shows just enough cleavage to be interesting. <laughs> just enough cleavage to be a tad bit inappropriate. <laughs> no, it's not inappropriate at all. If it was inappropriate, it would like be down like there. So when I wear it, it would come down there. Whereas now it comes down like there. Yeah. Just, you know, a bit of a peek. <laughs> <laughs> Because some people really can make you feel so bad, you know? Like, you come out of their, your house and you're dressed up, and if it was another girl that was dressed up to the nines, she would walk down the street and she will get a wolf whistle. But you, the blind one, you get dressed and you come out of the street and somebody comes and tells you, you're so brave coming out all by yourself. It must be so terrifying being blind. And I'm like, do you know, if I came out of my house depressed, you would make me have a reason to go back in and hang myself. The sunset. I like it. Do you know when there's been a really, really big storm and then the storm is gone and the rainbow is also gone, but the sky looks like it's been crying. You know when you cry for ages and your eyes go red and the sky goes a bit red like that, like it's been crying for ages. And when it's that, colour, everything under it has a tint, like a rose tint. So we, I remember we had a white car that time, and if you looked at the car under that sunset, it looked a bit palish pink or palish gold. I can't remember the... I can't quite put a finger on that colour, but it was beautiful. In, in that light, even a, a fierce lion could look angelic. Do you know what I mean? Mm. 